Hi everyone, welcome to Hope Online. My name's Phil. I'm Jonathan. And we want to just welcome you. If it's your first time, you've just clicked on a link that a friend has sent you, or actually you've been joining us on Hope Online across this whole season. We have got a great meeting ahead of us um, today, but we just want to spend a few moments just to discuss a, a few things um, as a church moving forward. We've just got a few things that we want to talk about. So let me invite you to uh, cast your mind back to March of this year when pretty much overnight uh, all our ways of gathering together disappeared and we were barely able to gather at all. Uh, to me it was a bit like we've been living on this mountain top plain and suddenly we've fallen over a cliff edge and uh, we land safely but probably dazed and confused in, in this place we've never been to before. And I think it's becoming clear to us that actually getting back to that mountain plain, getting back to those gatherings is not just going to happen overnight. It's not going to be the same in reverse. But we, uh, what we can do and what we are doing is to look for pathways, if you like, back up this mountainside, ways to, to start uh, getting back up to where we used to be. And that requires each one of us really to take personal responsibility for uh, the way we connect with God and with the church. Uh, and we want to help with that. We want to provide opportunities. We want to provide tools for you to use. We want to provide things that will equip and encourage and stir you as we all seek to follow Jesus and to reach out to this lost world that we're in. Now, one of those pathways that, that Jonathan's beginning to explain is, is actually our use of our church building, our use of the, the Middlebrook Centre. And, and actually, as a, as a youth team, we're beginning to explore what, what can we do for our, for our youth in the building. They've done a lot of online stuff, um, but as they begin to go back to school and as, as things change, actually there might be some possibilities that we can meet in smaller groups. And, and I know that there's a lot of other opportunities for, for other groups to meet in the building as well, as, as one of the pathways that we can, that we can get to school. Our community groups have already blazed the trail. They've done a great job at finding creative ways to stay in touch, to connect and to care for the groups. And I, I must say, I want to honour the community group leaders. It's been great working alongside them in serving the church in this season. Uh, if you're not a part of a community group this morning and you're interested, please get in touch. We'd love to connect you up. And alongside that, in this coming season, we're also going to be announcing some sign-up small groups, just some different ways to connect, some different things around a subject, around a passion or whatever. So look out for those in the coming weeks. So we're just beginning to, to unroll the map, so to speak, of, of what these pathways are looking up going up the mountain. Now, Steve Chick is going to be on Instagram Live on Thursday at 8 o'clock, just going into a little bit more detail about actually how we explore these different pathways. Now, if you miss it live, then there'll be a link which will be sent out, which will mean that you can access it, whether you've got Instagram or not, actually. So coming up today, we've got Steve Chick, who's going to be launching our new series, Life with Jesus. And he's going to follow that with communion. So make sure you've got some bread and wine or whatever you have ready to hand. But before that, Joe Gubb is going to lead us in worship. And I'd encourage you, wherever and whenever you're watching this, and however you feel comfortable, to join in. Let's let our praise rise up to heaven like our prayers, because we've got a God who's worthy of praise.
sing it out. You're all I've ever needed. You're all that I want. Help me know you are near. Draw me close to Let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will. Nothing else will take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Oh, help me find a way to bring you back to me. Oh, you're Heart of worship, 
Cause it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship It's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply can't. Longing just to bring something that's so worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for the song in itself is not what you have required. I search much deeper within to the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart I worship. Cause it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. It's all about you, Jesus King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Alone, weak and poor All I am is yours Every single I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required I search much deeper within Than the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I paid When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship It's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus You're worthy of it all Of it all. For from you are all things, to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Jesus, we want to give you our worship. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For 
from you are all things To you are all things Yes, you deserve the glory You are worthy of it all You are worthy of it all Everything that we have we will give you, Lord for from you are all things, and to you are all things, yes, you deserve the glory. Oh, day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. From you are all things, to you are all things, you deserve the glory. Jesus, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all to you are all things, you deserve the glory. Today we're starting our new series uh, entitled Life with Jesus and it's based on the New Testament letter of 1 John uh, and it's written by one of Jesus' disciples, John. Uh, uh, it's written around about uh, 60 or so years after Jesus' death and resurrection and John is writing to uh, churches that he knows that he's been involved with and uh, Christians those people who are followers of Jesus and he's writing because he's there's some things he wants them to be sure about and so he writes them this letter which is really important only yesterday I was myself looking at a 32 year old letter it's a letter written by my father to me my dad uh, wrote to me and one of the things he wrote in the letter is this let me read it to you he said this, please, please, before you do anything, be absolutely convinced that what you do is right. It's the only letter my dad ever wrote to me. 
Uh, it was written 18 months before my, my dad died. But my dad is concerned that I don't uh, make a mistake and I don't ruin my life. I was, at the time, I was, uh, I, I was, I, I just made a decision. I was giving up my job. I was leaving uh, where I had grown up, Swansea, leaving my friends, my family, and I was moving down to the south of England. And, and I was going to work alongside someone and we were going to uh, start uh, a new church. That was the plan. And my dad was concerned that I was uh, going to make a poor decision. And so he wrote to me. I've still got the letter today. John is writing to those that he knows and loves. He's writing as a, a father figure to his spiritual children. And he's saying there's some things that I want you to be absolutely sure about. I want you to be confident of. I don't want you to do the wrong thing. You see, John has followed Jesus for a, a lifetime. We first uh, read about John in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, and uh, we read about him. He's a fisherman. He's mending nets. And Jesus walks by and he says to John, he says, follow me. John drops the nets that he's been repairing, mending, preparing, and he follows Jesus. And he's, 60 years later, we still find him following Jesus. Phil Moore in his commentary says that uh, the word that Matthew used for preparing is the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians when he writes to the Ephesian church and he talks about them preparing and helping get ready the church, God's people, uh, to serve him, to do good works. And so the point is this, John is writing this letter and he is preparing, mending uh, uh, the church net to make sure that none slip through. He wants none uh, to, uh, uh, to escape, if you like, from a, a net that they don't need to because he wants the church to flourish and he wants the church to do well. And so John is writing this letter uh, to help people know uh, what they can be certain of, things that they can be sure of. You see, Foundations in the Christian life are really important. And if we're not sure of our foundations, if we don't have certain foundations, then what happens? They get undermined. And I don't know if you've been watching the news recently, um, the storm uh, a, a, a few uh, days ago even, the storm uh, impacted the Jurassic coastline. Parts of the cliff face uh, along the Jurassic coastline fell in, caved over because it had been undermined. And John is writing because he doesn't want our Christian faith to be undermined. He wants us to be certain in these days. See, John knows that uh, that uh, the church is under pressure from outside. The Roman Empire is uh, wanting the church to conform to the Roman way of doing things. In uh, the Roman Empire, you had to bow down and worship Caesar. Caesar is Lord. Uh, the early Christians wouldn't do that. They would only bow the knee to Jesus. And so they were under intense pressure and, and they were in danger of being in, in, in facing the ferocity of the opposition of the Roman Empire. They were in danger. Some were in danger of caving in. And John wants them, no, 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 be certain of some things. And uh, we're going to look at some of those in a moment. But we live in days where we need to be certain about our faith. We live in a society that is telling us uh, uh, certain things that the Bible doesn't agree with. All sorts of things that, uh, uh, in this politically correct world that run counter to what the Bible says. And John would say to us today, no, 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 you need to be certain. You need to be certain of some things. You don't want your faith to be undermined. And equally, they were in danger. Uh, the early church were in danger of being uh, impacted, undermined from within. There were people who were coming into the church and teaching things that weren't true. And uh, in John's day, they were called Gnostics. And Gnosticism comes from the Greek word to know. There were people coming and saying, actually, if you really want to know God, if you really want to know God, there's a special knowledge and we can help you get it. John was saying, no, no, no. You, there is only one way to know God. 
and that's through Jesus Christ. And you need to be certain of that. Otherwise, your uh, faith is in danger of being undermined. So without going any further, let's have a look at the beginning of 1 John and let's read the first four verses together. And this is what it says in the Christian Standard Bible. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we also declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So John is reminding us of three things that we can be sure about. And so here's the first one. John wants us to be sure about God's Son. Uh, Annie and I, uh, a number of years ago, we invited some of our neighbours to come and find out about Christianity. And we uh, uh, ran some evenings in our home where we talked about some of the foundational truths about Jesus and what Jesus taught. And a number of our neighbours, about uh, three or four of our neighbours came along uh, to the evenings. And uh, one of them, I remember one of them being absolutely shocked. Uh, in fact, was actually quite cross when she uh, heard us talk about uh, the historical evidence for the existence of Jesus. She'd grown up believing that Jesus was a myth, that he didn't really exist. He wasn't a real person. He was a figment of, uh, uh, of people's imagination. Someone uh, back in uh, who, who may, you know, almost like a legend. When she heard that there was more evidence, historical evidence for the existence of Jesus than there was for Julius Caesar, I remember being really, really angry. John is writing this letter. He's writing as a witness, a first hand witness of someone who has seen Jesus. And so he opens up this letter and he, he says, I, I want you to be sure about who Jesus is. He said, I heard Jesus speak. John talks about hearing Jesus. He heard him. He heard the things Jesus said. Jesus said the sorts of things that only God would say. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John heard him say it. John would have been shocked when he heard Jesus equate himself with God. John, uh, as he heard him, knew that actually there was something about what he said. He wasn't just one of these people who says things. I mean, we, we all hear people say things. We hear them say it on the Internet. But are they true? Does their life live up to what they say? No, no, no. John says, no, no, I heard him, but I saw him. And he says that he saw Jesus four times. He makes the point. He's emphasizing the point. I saw him. I saw this Jesus. I didn't just hear him. I saw him. And the last time he uses the word saw, it, it means examine carefully. John examined carefully. He, he got to see Jesus close hand. He saw what he was like. He didn't just see him as he was speaking to big crowds of people telling stories and parables. No, no. John saw him when he was tired and hungry and on his own. He saw him when he was, uh, had been abandoned and let down. He saw him when he was feeling low. John saw him uh, as uh, he handled crowds of people who were needy. He saw how he treated the oppressed and the lepers and those that others wouldn't touch. He saw how he got angry with those who should have cared for broken and damaged people and yet they took advantage of them. He saw Jesus' anger. He saw Jesus close at hand. He saw Jesus on a cross. He saw him die. John was a first-hand witness of Jesus dying. He saw him die. 
And we're told that when he heard, when the first women came running back from the tomb saying, his body's gone, he's, he's not there. Someone's taken his body. John ran to the tomb. And, and we're told he goes in and, and it says he saw and believed. He saw Jesus had been raised from the dead. We're told later that he saw Jesus physically with his own eyes, the resurrected Jesus. The Jesus who he saw die, he saw him alive. John saw Jesus. And yet more than that, John says, I, I heard him speak. I, I saw him, but I handled him. I touched him. I held him. I put my head on his lap. John encountered Jesus. He touched him. He, 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 he knew Jesus was a real person. We need to know Jesus like that. It's not enough to just know of him. It's not enough to hear what he says. It's not just enough to read and see what he was like in the New Testament. But we need an encounter with Jesus just like John. And John, uh, when he writes uh, these things that he heard and he saw and he touched, he, uh, in the Greek, he uses the perfect tense. And he uses it particularly because the perfect tense, what the perfect tense uh, uh, conveys is it conveys a historical event, something that happened in the past that has, is still having deep impact in the present. John is still a passionate follower of Jesus 60 years after he heard him and saw him and touched him. That the events of the past are still impacting his life, still transforming his life. What about you during lockdown? What about you during this season where everything seems to have been shut down? We can't meet together. We've been stopped from meeting together. Are you still looking back on the events of Jesus' death on the cross and what he did for you? Does it still fill your heart with joy every morning? Does it still transform you as you get up in the morning as, or have you been overwhelmed by circumstances? John wants you to know God's son, wants you to be sure about Jesus, God's son. The second thing that John wants us to be sure about is this. He wants us to be sure about the gospel. John says at the beginning of his letter, what was from the beginning? Why does he use the phrase, what was from the beginning? Why doesn't he say what uh, he was from the beginning? Why does he say what was? John wants us to be sure who Jesus is. That's why he talks about seeing him and hearing him and touching him. But he wants us to be sure about the good news, what Jesus came to do. We were spiritually dead. We were far from God. We didn't know God. We were dead to God. That's what the Bible says. And Jesus has come to make us alive to God. Jesus has come to draw us into a relationship with God. Jesus wants us to have a relationship with his Father. Jesus wants us to know our Father in heaven. And John is writing to make sure that we know and we are confident in the gospel. And you know, it's all in his name, Jesus Christ. His name says it all. Jesus reminds us of his humanity. It's a, a name, just uh, lots of people were called Jesus in the day. If you go to Mexico today, it's a common name. Jesus was a man just like us. God became man as we've talked about. Jesus fully understands our frailties our temptations. Maybe you've been struggling over these last weeks and months. Maybe you're feeling lonely, isolated, frustrated. Mainly, maybe you're feeling disappointed and um, let down. Jesus knows what you feel like. Jesus lived as a man just like us. He understands our emotions. However tough life is for us, Jesus knows and can sympathise with us in our weakness. Jesus understands. Jesus also taught, uh, reminds us of what he came to do, his mission. 
The Bible says that he will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The Bible talks about us being alienated from God. We've lived without reference to God. The Bible calls that sin. It's a simple Bible word. It's not used much. It's not liked much in today's world. But the Bible says that we are sinful, that we are separated from God. And Jesus came to deal with our sin and restore us to a relationship with our Father in heaven. You see, the gospel is not so much about church strategy. strategy. It's not so much about power. It's not about us working hard. All those things are important. God uh, uh, doesn't write off strategy, doesn't write off. He gives us his power. He, he wants us to work hard. But the gospel is all about Jesus Christ. God wants us to know the gospel is all about Jesus. Maybe during this season you felt like giving in. Maybe you felt like, what's this all about? Is this Christian faith really worth it? John wants to encourage you this morning that Jesus is still the answer. John wants you to encounter him afresh, draw near to him afresh. John wants you to know that Jesus is living and, and in heaven praying for you, interceding for you, pleading for you. And if he's for you, who can stand against you? The writer of the Hebrews says that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. We need to consider him so that we don't grow, we grow weary and lose heart. God doesn't want you to lose heart. If you feel like you've been losing heart, you need to focus afresh on Jesus. You see, he never gave up on us. When he was on the cross, we were on his mind. Jesus Christ. It's not a surname. It's who he is. Jesus Christ means Messiah, the Messiah, God's promised deliverer, the one that's going to set us free from all that holds us back, all the things that keep us from a relationship with a holy God. Jesus was the one who was going to bring good news to the poor, to the broken hearted, to the needy. Jesus is the one who's going to bring freedom for all those who are captive to their uh, emotions and their fears and their anxieties and the things that control their lives. Jesus is the one that comes to set us free. That's good news and it's still good news today. Are you confident, are you sure in the gospel what Jesus has done for us? You see, Jesus may now have ascended to be with his Father in heaven, but his mission is not over. He's given us his authority. He's called us as his followers to bring his kingdom wherever we go, to be Jesus to the people we meet, to bring the message of hope to the hopeless, to bind up the brokenhearted. He's called us to do that. We're his ambassadors, Paul tells the Corinthians, and we have his authority. We may be a scattered people. We may not be able to gather together on Sunday mornings. But this season is an opportunity. No special revelation is needed. We need confidence in the gospel, in the good news about Jesus. This is personal. It's why Paul says... Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. That's why he says that to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 8. What about you? Is this your gospel? Is this good news for you? Has it changed your life? Is it still changing your life? John wants you to be certain of it. Finally, we need to be sure about the goal. You see, the goal for all those who read John's letter is that fellowship, relationship with God and with each other is really 
possible. The Greek word is koinonia. It's a, an unusual word. It, it means more than just socialising. It means relationship with a purpose. I, uh, many years ago, uh, played for a football team, uh, a Christian uh, football team when I was in university. The name of the team was Koinonia. And um, uh, it was an interesting name for a football team. Nobody else, I think, knew what it meant. But we were supposed to exude uh, uh, relationship, friendship, love with purpose. And uh, I can say probably on occasions, the name calling ourselves Koinonia was a bit of a misnomer because we didn't always live up uh, to what the unnamed uh, said about us. But John says that as Christians, we are to have relationship, fellowship, uh, a relationship with purpose with our Father and with each other. It's possible and it's all because of Jesus. John, in his gospel, he refers to himself five times as the disciple that Jesus loved. Do you know, he wasn't boasting. He wasn't saying Jesus didn't love the other disciples. He was saying, do you know what? I am so overwhelmed. Jesus loves me. He loves me. He was overwhelmed by this fact. It... Uh, filled his life. He knew that God unconditionally loved him. It wasn't based on what he did or how he performed. He didn't need a special knowledge. He didn't need a theology degree. He didn't need to have parents who went to church. He knew God loved him because of Jesus and what Jesus did for him. You see, we receive new life, the fullness of life through a relationship with God through Jesus. That's what the Bible says. This koinonia, this fellowship, it's for us. And it, it affects not only our relationship with God, but it affects our relationship with one another. You see, fellowship is truly experienced when there are no barriers between us, when we share a common love for the same things. That's what we're supposed to have as, as Christians, no barriers between us relationship with no barriers relationship with a common love for Jesus you see the amazing thing is this Jesus has removed every barrier between us and God God is now our father he loves us completely God effectively says because you love Jesus you are my friends he says to Jesus, any friend of yours is a friend of mine. Jesus says, you're my friends. If you give your life to me, if you put your trust in me, you're my friends. If you follow me, if you obey what I say, you're my friends. And Jesus has brought us into this magnificent, this beautiful relationship with his father. You see, Jesus is no fair weather friend. The Bible says he sticks closer than a brother. He never lets us go. He's a friend that will always love us. He laid down his life for us. If we're friends of Jesus, we're friends of God. We can be real with God and he won't give up on us. He's a real father. He loves us so much he doesn't want to leave us in the state that we're in. But this is not just for our relationship with God. This is about our relationship with each other. So as our relationship with God develops, we become more like him. And so Paul can say, we have the mind of Christ. And that impacts how we treat one another. It impacts how we speak to one another. It impacts how we think about one another. The things that we do it impacts the fact that we want to be kind to those around us, that we want to put other ne others' needs before our own. That is what this fellowship is all about. You see, the more we love God and the closer we get to him, the closer we get to others who love God. It doesn't matter what their nationality, doesn't matter what their background is, doesn't matter about their ethnicity. We can have intimate friendship. Annie went to Rwanda with a, a team from the church uh, about 18 months ago. And when she came back, she talked about 
uh, Stephen, one of the uh, compassion hosts that had been looking after him. It was a compassion trip. And um, I, I, I talked about him really warmly. What a lovely guy he was. Do you know what? Through lockdown, every now and again, she gets a text message from Stephen saying, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you and, 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 uh, and your husband. Pastor Steve, she calls me. And he says, I'm praying for you, thinking about you. Why would he do that? Because we're part of the same family. How can this work out in this season? Well, we don't sit around waiting for church to happen. We are church. You are church. Wherever you go, you bring church. Whether it's to your neighbour or to the ones that you are able to invite into your home, the people you walk with, you are Jesus. You're his hands and his feet. As we draw to a conclusion this morning, God wants us to be sure about Jesus. He wants us to be sure about this gospel, this good news. And he wants us to enjoy, enjoy fellowship with him and each other. And John says that if we do that, we can expect to be filled with joy, despite all that's happening in the world around us. In this world, Jesus said, you'll have trouble. And yet he promised to make our joy full. Literally means filled, full, overflowing. Jesus says, whatever is happen happening, we can be overflowing with joy. That should mark our lives. If we have, if we're sure about Jesus, if we're sure about the gospel, if we're sure about our relationship with God and those around us, our joy should overflow. We will never know this joy until we are sure about Jesus. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, joy has been the characteristic of the church in every period of reformation and revival. What conquered the ancient world was this joy, this gladness, this verve, this indestructible quality in the life of these people. And this is the greatest need in the world today. We're going to spend some time now doing what John has encouraged us to do. We're going to remember Jesus. John uh, was one of Jesus' closest followers. He would have had lots of meals with Jesus. He was there at the Last Supper. And uh, after Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, John and the uh, first disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and in the book of Acts, we read what happens. We hear, uh, read about how numbers of people were added to the church. And when they were added to the church, each one of them were encouraged to uh, do what we've been encouraging ourselves to do this morning, to be sure about the gospel, to be sure about Jesus. And they, we're told, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. It says a little later, Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. As we come to remember Jesus, we're going to break bread. And it's a powerful moment for us. We are taking bread, which is just a symbol. It's a symbol of Jesus' body broken for us. Jesus said, I and the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never grow hungry. We're going to take this bread and we're going to remember that Jesus' body was broken for us. We're going to remember he did it for us. That past event has an impact in our lives today. It brings us great joy and confidence as we come and remember that Jesus died for us. So we're going to break bread and remember Jesus' body broken for us. We're going to take wine. We're going to remember Jesus' blood. The Bible says that without uh, the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. As we drink this wine, we remember that Jesus' blood was shed for us and we are forgiven. We come before the God of heaven and earth, forgiven, accepted, 
beloved children. And so that's what we're doing. That's why this meal is so precious. It's precious to those who love Jesus, those who have given their lives to him, those who are confident and sure that they belong to him, who are overwhelmed and thrilled at the gospel. And so that's what we're going to do. And so we're going to take bread and we're going to eat it. And we're going to thank God for the gift of his son. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we say thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son. You sent your Son into this sin-sick world, this needy world, that you would draw people like us who are far from you to yourself, that you would make sons and daughters of rebels. We thank you that you have loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die in our place that we can be forgiven, that we can be adopted into your family. We say thank you that this past event is now impacting our lives today. We say, Father, in the midst of all that's going on around us, help us live lives that reflect the wonder of what Jesus has done for us. Help us as a scattered people in these days be a people who demonstrate to those around that Jesus Christ is alive and he's transformed our lives, he's changed our lives and he can do the same for them. Father, help us be your ambassadors in these days. For those of us who are struggling and battling with all, all of the pressures that these days have brought, Father, come and strengthen them. Thank you that Jesus died for them. May they know the strengthening of God in their spirits. May they be sure of the gospel, sure that you're a good God who loves them and is for them. And may they lift their eyes from the circumstances and turn their hearts once more to Jesus Christ. May they remember him. May they focus their eyes on him, that they would not grow weary and lose heart. Father, may your spirit come and fill each person who's watching right now. May they know the presence of your spirit, strengthening and encouraging them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that, Steve. And if you've been encouraged by this message and you've got a friend who you know actually it will bless, why don't you send them a link to it? And if you're watching live, we got a prayer team that's ready and waiting if you like prayer. Just follow the link below. If you're just around and want to connect a bit more, we've also got a Zoom coffee meeting that will start shortly. Again, follow the link below. And make sure you remember that we've got Instagram Live on Thursday where Steve's going to be talking a little bit more of detail of those pathways that we discussed earlier on in the meeting. But other than that, have a great day and we will see you next week. See you next week.